tonight, new video into Outfront showing a fierce battle unfolding on the eastern front of Ukraine. And this is the moment a Ukrainian soldier spots two Russians that are running just feet away from him. Then he opens fire. And uh, this, this new video that we are seeing uh, today comes as Vladimir Putin appeared earlier with a top ally, the Chechen warlord Ramzan Kadyrov, amidst speculation the Kadyrov's health was deteriorating. Now, Ukraine claimed the Kadyrov was gravely ill from kidney failure. Unsubstantiated reports suggested he'd been poisoned or even died. But tonight, the Kremlin wants you to know that Kadyrov, the warlord who some experts say has a father-son-like relationship with Putin, and of course, many say has been instrumental in the war, is alive. Matthew Chance is out front. Behind the daily strikes, an information war is raging. Fueling speculation about key Russian figures, forcing the Kremlin to dispel the rumors. Like those swirling around hardline Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov, now shown on state TV, meeting President Putin after rumors he's gravely ill. Rumors spread by Ukrainian intelligence and that Kadyrov has denied on social media. I strongly advise all those who can't tell the difference between truth and lies on the internet to go for a walk in the fresh air and put their thoughts in order, he wrote. In recent weeks, Russia has been busy denying Ukrainian claims that a strike on its Black Sea Fleet headquarters in Sevastopol killed dozens of Russian naval officers, including the overall commander. But Admiral Viktor Sokolov soon appeared in an undated video call with Russian defense officials his stiff appearance, though, only fueled speculation about his condition. Finally, the Admiral is shown handing out medals to the Russian Navy soccer team, answering questions apparently on the attack, although CNN can't verify when the event took place. Could you please tell us in a few words what happened to reassure Sevastopol residents? Nothing happened to us. Life goes on. The Black Sea Fleet is carrying out the tasks assigned to it by the command. But prominent Russians do have a tendency to occasionally drop from view. General Sergei Surovikin, a senior Russian commander linked with Wagner, disappeared after recording a statement calling for the mercenary group to abandon its rebellion back in June. Months later, in September, this image was circulated, purporting to show Surovikin and his wife out and about in Moscow in a bid to dispel rumours of his arrest. And even Russia's defence minister, shortly after the full-scale invasion of Ukraine last year, vanished from view for over a week, eventually popping back up on a video conference call with Putin, a sign perhaps he was back in favour. And Erin, um, you know, the Kremlin will criticise, um, you know, the reports that come out from Ukraine, from the West, about where people are and, and what's happened to them. But the truth is, it's such an opaque country now. Even Russians don't know what's really going on. So the whole country is rife with exactly that kind of speculation. Right. I mean, even Prigozhin, right? Then there was, was he alive? Was he not? I mean, there, anything. Uh, he disappeared for a while. And then he, he, he emerged when he... His plane crashed, of right. course. So. All right, Things thank happen. you very much, Matthew Chance. And the big question tonight around Russia is whether the United States can transfer $300 billion in Russian assets to Ukraine. All this frozen money, right, just give it to Ukraine. Well, the renowned constitutional expert Lawrence Tribe says, yes, they can, it is completely legal, and it must be done immediately. Out front now is the Harvard Law School professor, Lawrence Tribe. And, Professor, I appreciate your time. So you spent a lot of time thinking about this. And, you know, we, we've talked about this in, at, the, at the beginning of the war, certainly, right, the images of the yachts and uh, frozen assets. Uh, right now, uh, we understand there are about $300 billion mm -hmm. in known frozen Russian assets sitting in international banks. So this is actual cash that you're referring to. You say that it is legal to give that money to Ukraine, and I believe now. Tell me why. Well, basically, the International um, Emergency Economic Powers Act that Congress enacted many years ago gave explicit power to the American president to seize and transfer, and the word used in the statute is transfer, frozen assets that have been frozen pursuant to sanctions when 
the president declares a relevant international economic emergency, and Biden has done that. So in my view, and I have studied it with the help of brilliant lawyers at the law firm of Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink, at the request of the Renew Democracy Initiative, yeah. the conclusion that after six months of careful study is that there is just no question about the president's power in the United States to transfer the 35 billion or so that are frozen here, rather than just letting that money stay idle. And once that's happened, the other 300 billion frozen in other countries from Canada to various countries in Europe, that can be released as well and transferred to Ukraine. You showed in earlier video the devastation in Ukraine. It's the result of an aggressive, illegal war determined to be a war of genocide. Putin himself is under the threat of arrest should he go anywhere outside of Russia, basically. And for all of this money to simply sit there and do nothing while yeah. children are kidnapped and people are murdered and raped is an outrage. That's why I think it should be done now. I, I do want to point out, um, by the way, when you talk about $335 billion, we know uh, Swiss banks, a lot of other places. I'm just pointing out as a matter of record, there's a lot more money and a lot more that can be done in terms of freezing right. assets. Um, it's a separate point from what you're making, but I, but I think one just worth making so people uh, don't forget. Um, I, I do want to... Um, just give the side here that, that maybe this isn't a good idea, that some have put forth. Uh, Bloomberg News editorial report, uh, board this summer said that a move that you suggest would, quote, set a worrying legal precedent. And they say, and, and I quote them, respect for state and private property is essential to modern economies and a functioning global trading system. By confiscating Russian assets, the U.S. and Europe would risk undermining that hard-won norm while giving other governments an incentive to take punitive action against Western interests. What do you think about that argument? That it just invites sort of a, a payback and a back and forth that ends up in a really bad place for everyone. No, international law makes clear that when there is an illegal war of aggression that annexes a sovereign state, then countermeasures are entirely appropriate. And if what this does is create incentives for other countries not to commit the kind of illegal aggression that Russia has committed, that's just fine. A lot of hard-headed people, Bob Zelik, the former president of the World Bank, yep. Lawrence Summer, the former secretary of the Treasury, have looked into this with us and have concluded that there would not be a destabilizing effect. There wouldn't be what some people call de-dollarization. In fact, the incentives would all be entirely positive. So all of the scare tactics about how this would be destabilizing, they're just not true. What is destabilizing is to have a country for the first time since World War II break the international agreements and simply invade a neighbor, a sovereign neighbor. Mm. And it's not private property I'm advocating taking. It's actually very complicated to take the private yachts of oligarchs. That's all tied up in litigation. But a nation like Russia does not have private property rights. It's a sovereign. And because it's a sovereign nation, it's a matter of international diplomacy, not a matter of law. That's why Canada, following the examples that we said in this report, is considering not involving the courts in the seizures so that the judicial obstacles to seizing these assets will not be in the way. You know, I've studied this for decades, and I think the answer is clear. The power of the executive branch to engage in foreign policy along these lines in order to discourage illegal aggression is very clear, both in the United States and in other G7 countries. All right. Well, Professor Tribe, I appreciate your...